Just let me know when you're ready and we'll get started. Okay, while they're, while they're getting ready, some other people are coming. Don't forget, not this week, but next week, we'll have our uh, Macho Men of Matoka meeting. See, there's people leaving after Josh's <laughs> class. Next, uh, next week, on Tuesday, we'll have our Mighty Macho Men of Matoka meeting. We're going to shoot some skeet and eat barbecue. So don't think it doesn't have something to do with the Bible. Acts chapter 10, verse 13, God told Peter, kill it and grill it. And so we're going to practice killing something and we're going to practice eating something. So just bring something. We don't care what it is, something that you barbecued. And if you don't have a uh, shotgun, don't worry about it. We'll have plenty. And we'll have plenty of shells and, and we'll have skeet. And we'll just have a great time, okay? Then Thursday night, the ladies are going to have their monthly meeting, and uh, they're going to have a special guest. Gearbox Ranch Granny is going to come and teach the ladies how to do some canning, okay? Because you girls need to know how to can. I've been saying that for 10 years here. Why don't you ladies teach the younger ladies some stuff that really matters, like how to make coconut cream pie? and how to make chicken and noodles. And so we have a lady that's volunteered to teach all you ladies chicken and noodles. And so that night we may have some men help clean up in the kitchen that night. But anyway, that's not this coming week, that's next week and it's gonna be a great time. So we do those things so that you can invite your friends and they don't have to sit and listen to me preach or teach or whatever, they can just have fun. And, uh, and that's what they're for, uh, so that you've got an opportunity to bring some friends. Now, when your friends come here, if everybody plays nice, then maybe they'll stay here. I don't know. But that's the ideal. And so tonight you came on a very special night, and you're in the book of Hebrews. And it is one of the most difficult books to teach. It, there are more heresies taught in the church out of the book of Hebrews than probably any other book. And the reason why is Hebrews uh, is not written for the church age, but people in the church age try to place it to them doctrinally. Um, the book of Acts is a transitional book. That's why there's so many heresies taught out of the book of Acts. They're transitioning from the Judaism religion of the law into the new Christianity. And the book of Acts spans several years and so it's transitioning for example some churches are built on the erroneous ideal that peter in chapter two of acts knew everything about everything that you know and in acts chapter two peter had just been filled with the spirit for 10 minutes when he started preaching and he doesn't say anything about the atonement he does not even realize at that point what had happened on the cross. He preaches to a group of Jews that they were part and parcel of the murder of Jesus Christ. But Peter doesn't understand everything that he understands 10 years later, 15 years later. So if you take Acts chapter 2 and you start applying it to the church doctrinally, you'll wind up church of Christ. Because Acts 2.38 says, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sin. Well, we're not worried about remission of sin now. We're talking about redemption of sin. But Peter didn't understand redemption yet. All he knew was the Jewish baptism for remission. So you've got to understand, it's a transitional book. So there are a million different traps to get caught in. The book of Hebrews it's not to the Christian church in the church age doctrinally. In other words, you can't build your doctrine out of the book of Hebrews. My lands, it's named Hebrews. Most people, that's profound. That's why y'all pay me the big money. It's named Hebrews. It's written by a Hebrew to Hebrews. Now the hard thing, there's another car leaving.
the hard thing is to figure out what group of Hebrews. Now, this book, and I hope you understand what I say when I say it, it's a cottonmouth rattle moxican. It will bind you up just as easy as it'll set you free. It will kill you just as easy as it'll give you life. It depends on how you wield it. And you know what it says of itself? It says that it discerns the intent of your heart when you read it. There's not another book in the Library of Congress that can do that. There's not another book that makes the claim that it discerns your motive when you read it. There's also not another book that says the Holy Spirit will help you to understand it. So here's my premise. You won't hear it anywhere else unless you're in David J. Sunday School class. The book of Hebrews is written to the Hebrews in the tribulation. Now, this is very hard to teach because people's never heard it before. And they just automatically, people hate change, you know. <laughs> don't change, I don't want to change, you know. But um, you have to understand, the Apostle Paul comes on the scene and he says, you know what, this is a new age. This is a dispensation of grace. This is the bride of Christ. There's not Jew or Gentile. There's not Greek or Jew. There's not bound or free. There's not rich or poor. There's not male or female in the body of Christ. Now let's hang on a second. We know there's males and females. Now there's a lot of people in the world today that are confused. They're not sure if they're males or females. But we're not confused here. We're pretty sure we know what we are. But what is Paul saying? That there's not male or female in the body of Christ. That there's not Jew or Gentile. Well, there actually is Jew or Gentile, but not according to God. We're all now in this dispensation called the body of Christ, the day of grace. Everything's changed. After the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it changed everything. There's never been a day like this. There's never been a salvation like this. There's never been a gospel like this. When Noah preached for 120 years, he wasn't preaching Jesus died on a cross and resurrected. That was not the gospel then. But that's the gospel now. But that wasn't the gospel then. The gospel then was, hey, it's going to rain, get on the boat. Gospel is good news. So you got to understand dispensations. I am, there, there's, there's what's called dispensationalist. And then there's hyper dispensationalist, and then there's me. <laughs> I got dispensations inside dispensations. But at the end of this dispensation is the rapture of the church, and that dispensation is over. And when you read about the tribulational time in the book of Revelation and in the book of Daniel, you'll see now God does talk about Jews and Gentiles being separate. And God does talk about salvation being uh, believing in Jesus Christ and keeping the commandments. That's not your salvation today. In the book of Revelation, it talks about 144 uh, witnesses. And it says what about them? It says they're virgin, male, Jews. 12,000 from every 12 tribes. Was well, there a difference between Jews and Gentiles? There sure is. But not today. If you're a Jew, you don't get to God except through Jesus Christ. In this dispensation, it don't do you any good to be a Jew. Now, Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Hagin has a church a thousand times bigger than this, but his belly's bigger than mine too. So what does that mean? That means Kenneth Hagin's really, really fat. But he's a theologian, he's a billionaire, he's a whatever. He's also a deceiver and a devil. 
What he says is the Jewish people have their own special salvation worked out with God, and they don't need Jesus. I want to tell you something, that's devilish. But he collects millions and millions and millions of dollars from ignorant Christians who watch him on TV and just lap it up. Because he tells them, if you'll bless Israel, God will bless you. And if you'll bless me, I'll bless you. <laughs> you don't even know, most people don't even know who Israel is. And I can assure you, the people in control of the land of Israel today are not God's people. They worship the devil. Now, if you don't have that figured out, you've got a long way to go. So Kenneth Hagin not Kenneth Hagin, uh, Hagee is raising money for the devil. And your government is giving them hundreds of billions of dollars ever since 1948 when a bunch of devils put it together. Now, are you saying Israel's death? I'm telling you, God uses the devil. you got to understand that. Come on. They thought about putting Israel in a lot of different places, and then finally somebody said, eh, why don't we just give them back their homeland? Well, who do you think worked that out? God. But he used devils to do it. Do you know what Mr. Uh, Rothschilds is? David Rockefeller? Does that ring a bell? These people worship the devil, but God uses the devil and he put a nation back together. The Bible says, can a nation be born in a day? It was on May 14, 1948. But the Bible says that Jesus comes back there to save a remnant of people from the government of Israel that's destroying it. You just need to read your Bible. So this book <coughs> is the book of Hebrews so we don't try to apply it to our lives doctrinally. It's not to us, but it is for us. And boy, can you not learn some things. So we're going to get right into it tonight. It's going to be very difficult to teach, but we, we're not scared, right? So last time we told you that Hebrews chapter 3, verses 6 and 14 are not doctrinally statements to deal with anyone in the church age. Let's just look at them. Hebrews 3. Uh, verses 6 and 14. They look like they say that someone can lose their salvation. Well, this written to people that can. Watch. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Do you have to hold anything to the end? No, that's not your salvation, my friend. If you're saved, I don't know, that's between you and God. If you're born again, you were born of God's seed. You cannot be unborn. Now, the problem is most people just call it being saved. And they say, well, how are you saved? Well, you have to believe on Jesus, receive him. You just have to believe that Jesus. You have to admit that you're a sinner, confess your sins, believe on him. Well, all those are just mental assents. Well, if you just make a mental choice to believe on Jesus, you can later make a choice not to believe. That's how you get this ideal, well, I was saved, I have been saved, but I'm not now. Well, we're not talking about being saved. We're talking about being born again. And the Bible says when you hear the gospel, which is God's seed, and you're born of God's seed, you cannot be unborn your actual physical birth is just a teaching tool to teach you about the true spiritual birth. You can't be unborn physically any easier than you can be unborn spiritually. Matter of fact, in this age, when you're spiritually born again and circumcised by God where he cuts your fleshly sinful body away from your born again spirit and soul, he says you're sealed by the Holy Spirit till the day of redemption. Well, you, how are you going to get unsealed? Holy Spirit seals it. How are you going to get unsealed? Jesus said, 
that you're in the Father's hand and you're in His hand and no man can pluck you out. How are you going to get out? You can't be unborn. Now, before, before the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, yes, you could make a decision to follow God and then the next day decide not to and you'd die and go to hell. For example, you could, as a Jewish person after the giving of the law, you could just say, well, the law says that I need to bring this sacrifice to the tabernacle or temple, but I'm not going to. Well, 10-4, roger that, you're going to go to hell. But the New Testament tells you the blood of bulls and goats didn't clear any sin from anybody, but it was a requirement from God. It's a, it was a requirement that blood be shed, the innocent blood be shed for your guiltiness, and you had to do it. In Sunday school, some of you don't come to Sunday school, wish you would. We just went through the Passover. All you had to do was put blood on the, Paso on the door and the death angel would pass over your house. There's no mention of the amount of sin that inside that house, God's blood of the lamb covered all your sin. So many people have trouble with thinking that they can't be forgiven. Listen, in the Israeli camp of slaves, there was every known kind of sin imaginable. There's a million to three million people there. The population of Oklahoma, what kind of sinful people do you have in the population of Oklahoma? Too big for you to even imagine. The population of Bartersville. What kind of heinous individuals are in the pop? Too big. Oshaleda. In Oshaleda, there's every kind of sinful person in the world. So you're not going to find a group of a million and a half to three million people in the outskirts of Egypt, slaves to Egyptians, that aren't every known kind of sin man can fathom. And you know what? The Bible doesn't cover it up for them. The Bible tells you that they burned their children to the devil in the furnaces of Egypt. But God came to them and said, if you'll take the blood of this lamb and put it over your door, I'll cover your sin. Listen, don't start. Let's never get to where we start looking down our little pious nose at people and like we don't have sin. We still need the blood applied to our doorposts. But it covered every sin. So, do you have to hold out firm to the end? No, you're in a dispensation where you're born again, or you're not. Now, if you're born again, can't be unborn. Now, you can lose your inheritance. Now, I got two boys, one I'm really proud of, one I'm not so proud of, but I love them both. But you can have a, a son or a daughter, and you can write them out of your will, but you can't change the fact that they're your son or daughter. Now, Paul, in the book of Romans, is very clear. You can be born again and live a carnal life and everything you do from the point you're born into God's family will be burned up at the judgment seat of Christ. And you're there, you're in the family, but you don't have any reward and you don't have any inheritance. But you are a child of God. Now you can't lose your birth or you can't lose your quote unquote salvation, but you can lose your reward and what you do in this body, you will reap in this body. In other words, just because you're born again doesn't mean that you can't just live a life of sin and not reap the consequences. You sure will in this body, but not in your spirit. So we want to make sure we understand if you're born again, you don't have to hold on to anything to the end. He's got a hold of you. And sometimes he holds you just like this, and sometimes he holds you around the neck like that, but he's got a hold of you. And you need to be glad. Look at verse 14. 
This is another verse. They've written libraries about these verses. For we are made partakers of Christ if, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. Well, that's not to you. Number one, you're not a Hebrew. Any Hebrews in here? No. And number two, you don't have to hold something steadfast to the end. You ain't got enough power to hold something steadfast to the end. So, when you find a verse, or when you find two verses that seem to contradict one another, don't force them where they don't belong and make the whole Bible a lie. Remember 2 Timothy 2.15. You rightly divide the word of truth. You've got to know how to rightly divide it. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved, a workman need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You can't study the Bible properly without putting it in divisions. So, you try to find where they fit. Where do they go? So, when you find a verse that clearly says you cannot lose your new birth, you can't be unborn again, and verses that seem to say that you can lose your birth, you have to choose which one you believe. Notice the verses that clearly say you can't be unborn are found in the Pauline epistles written to the Gentile early church. From Paul, the apostle sent to the Gentiles. Watch, Romans 15, 16. Watch this. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel of God that the offering, the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Paul was sent to the Gentiles. So remember, we are Gentiles reading a book to Jews written from a Jew named Hebrews. Always keep that in the forefront of your memory while we study this book. So look at Matthew 24, 13. Now this is a Jewish writer, Matthew, talking about a Jewish Messiah. This is what the Jewish Messiah said to a group of Jewish believers about the end of the age. Watch what Jesus said about it. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. This question was asked of Jesus by Jewish disciples tell us about the end of the age Matthew 24 Mark 13 Luke 21 this lines exactly up with Hebrews you got to endure to the end the end of what the end of the age Jesus said you gotta you shall endure until the end and the same shall be saved so Look at Hebrews 3, 6 again. What's it say? You have to endure or hope firm unto the end. Look at 14. Steadfast confidence until the end. Are they starting to line up for you? The gospel of the grace of God that Paul preached, that's not this gospel at all. Look at 314. You're partakers of Christ if you hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Now watch. Matthew, a Hebrew, wrote that this Jewish Messiah, Jesus Christ, said the gospel was the gospel of the kingdom. That's not Paul's gospel of grace to the Jew and Gentile church in the church age let me give you the gospel in this age no other gospel 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1 through 4 moreover brethren I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you which also you have received and wherein you stand now in another place Paul said if anybody else 
Or if I come back later and I've lost my mind and I tell you something different, or if an angel from heaven comes and preach to you any other gospel, let God curse him. Because this is the gospel for this age. Watch it. By which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. He received it directly from Jesus on the backside of the desert for three years. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the seed of God that you have to hear in this age in order to be born of God's seed. That's the gospel. Okay? Now, I want to show you something. The gospel of the kingdom is a Jewish gospel. It's a Jewish gospel that at the end of the Hebrew, uh, the end of time, the Hebrew people will rule the whole world from Jerusalem. See, all of the scriptures in the Old Testament that talked about Israel ruling the world, that's why they all thought Jesus was going to set up the kingdom in his first coming. Haven't you read the, in the four Gospels where that's what they continually are asking Jesus? Are you going to overthrow the Roman government now? Who's going to set it the, at your right hand in your kingdom? When are you going to set up your kingdom? Even after his resurrection, the disciples, his closest disciples, didn't understand what had happened. And the first thing they asked him is, are you going to set up your kingdom now? I'm sure Jesus just shakes his head like, oh, good Lord. Now that gospel is for a time to come. All through the Old Testament, all through the stories about David and things, it says that David will sit on a throne for eternity in Jerusalem. That's why the Jewish people on the earth today believe that they're going to rule the world. They have scripture for it, but they have it in the wrong time. And so even when Jesus was here, they thought that time was now. But it wasn't their time yet. But he preached to them that the gospel of the kingdom, and they rejected it. So here we go, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 7. Watch what it said here. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and to any city of Samaritans enter ye not. Now he specifically told his disciples, Don't go preaching this gospel to the Gentiles. But yet God told Jesus told Paul to preach a gospel to the Gentiles. It's a different gospel. See, Jesus had to come and offer to the Jewish nation Israel the gospel of the kingdom. And if they had received Jesus, all this would have never happened. But they rejected him. Now that's when you get into your foreknowledge and predestination and all that stuff. Did Jesus know they was going to reject him? Yeah. Did he, then why did he offer himself up to be received? So they would reject him. But you got to make the offer before you can hold them accountable for rejecting yourself. So Jesus says, I want you to go out and preach this gospel of the kingdom. Don't preach it to no Gentiles because Gentiles are not going to rule the world. I don't know what you think. In eternity. He, and he said, and, and don't go to no Gentiles. And what? Go back to that verse if you will, guys. Verse 5. Jesus sent him forth says, uh, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of Samaritans enter you not. Well, is Jesus some kind of racist bigot? What's a Samaritan? Anybody know? What is it, Miss Carr? Or is that Jackie? Which one of you raise your hand, Jackie? Half breed. Half breed dogs, what Jesus said. Don't you know the story? Jesus is in there with all of his Jewish homies, and they're eating. 
in walks this half-breed dog. Oh, you said, man, that's racist. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. And she come in there and she said, hey, my daughter, man, she's vexed with a demon. Would you pray for my daughter? He said, man, go away from me. He said, I'm not sent to you. What's he doing? He got to present himself to the Jewish nation as the gospel of the kingdom. Kingdom's coming. He said, I'm not sent to you. Dog. Now, I will give Jesus this. I will give you this. The Greek word he used for dog is a beautiful little petted lap dog. <laughs> and she said, well, the dog get to eat the crumbs that falls off the master's table. You know the story, right? And he looked at her and he said, it ain't none of these Jews in here got that kind of faith. Then he tells his disciples, he said, I, I must needs go to Samaria. They're like, what? You're not going to Samaria. Over my dead body, Peter says. You're not going down there. They're half-breeds. See, their daddies were Jews, and their mamas was, who cares? Well, the Jewish religion is matriarchal. It's passed on by the mothers. If your mother was a Jew, you're a Jew. If your mother was not a Jew, you not. So the Samaritans were Jewish men who had married Gentile women. But you know what? They still worship God. They still had a relationship with God, and God still saved them. And Jesus said, I must needs, I've got to. I've got to go to Samaria. And the disciples, his disciples, that just loved him so much, they said, well, you're going by yourself, Joker, because we're not going with you. He said, okay. And he goes all alone. And they walk around that city to get something to eat, which was a long way. And when he got there, he had a divine encounter with one woman, the woman at the well. And she's very learned. She said, why are you talking to me? <laughs> you being a Jew, me being a Samaritan, why are you even talking to me? He said, well, uh, would you please give me a drink of water? She said, oh, <laughs> you Jews don't have anything to do with us till you're thirsty. I see how it is. He said, thirsty? If you knew who you was talking to, you'd ask me for a drink. And when you'd get a drink from me, you'd never thirst again. She said, you fool, you don't even have anything to draw water, and this well is really deep. Our father Jacob dug this well. Verse 6. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, I wish you'd have been here for the uh, six-month study we did on the difference between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. They're not the same kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is an earthly, physical, material, you can touch it, kingdom on this earth. Always in the New Testament when it talks about the kingdom of heaven, it's talking about a material. It's talking about an army. It's talking about a throne. It's talking about a castle. It's talking about a wall. It's talking about a landmass kingdom. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. The Bible says the, spirit, the, the kingdom of God is not meat or drink. The kingdom of God is spiritual. It's not something you can eat or something you can drink. It's something you can see or something you can handle. The kingdom of God is within. The kingdom of God is sitting here inside of each and every one of us that are born of God right now. The kingdom of God is reigning in our lives, but the kingdom of heaven is not here. It left when Jesus left. But when Jesus was here, there was an opportunity for both kingdoms to um, preside on the earth at the same time. And when he left, the kingdom of heaven left. But the kingdom of God is within you. So he said, go preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven... That's a different gospel. And the Jewish people, the lost tribes of Israel, the lost sheep of Israel, they rejected 
this gospel of the kingdom. So when he comes back, the remnant of Jewish people will gladly receive him. And he will not come back until they gladly receive him. Look at Hosea chapter 5, verse 15, and look at what the Messiah says. I will go and return to my place. Well, that means he must have been here one time, right? He said, I'm going to go back and return to my place till they, the children of Israel, acknowledge their offense. See, the, the nation of Israel committed the unpardonable sin. They ascribed what Jesus did to the devil. You can't do that. Nobody can do that. No individual could do it. No individual could ever do it. No individual could ever out the love and the grace and forgiveness of God. But the nation of Israel, that's a different thing. And you know what they, tell, they told Pilate? They said, let his blood be on our hands and our children's hands and our children's children's hands. So the Messiah says, I'm going to go back and return to my place until they acknowledge their offense, until they acknowledge who Jesus is and seek my face. Now, Lori Kendall went to Israel. She went to Petra, where most Bible theologians think they will run and seek and, and be saved in that place, that cleft, that in the side of the mountain that was carved out for giants to live in, they're going to run there and they're going to be safe there. Just a remnant. Not the whole nation of Israel by afar. He said, I'm going to go back to my place and I'm going to stay there till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. And in their affliction, they will seek me early. Now, if you got time, I'll stay here all night with you and show you verse after verse after verse that God says, at the end of time, at the, when it's the end, and that's what we're talking about here in Hebrews, God says, I'm going to bring in their enemies. I'm going to put a hook in their jaw. I'm going to bring this Gog and Magog battle to them. It seems like whoever this nation is of Gog and Magog, they don't really want to come, but God's going to hook them and draw them down there to the battle. God also says that their children are going to be sold into prostitution. God also says that their children are going to be sacrificed. God also says that they're going to drink their blood. Well, that's their affliction. <laughs> and when God gets through with them, they're going to recognize who he is, and they're going to seek his face, and they're going to beg him to come back and save them. Now, Jesus said he was going to come back, and if he didn't come back when he did, there would be no flesh left on the earth. That's a pretty big statement. That's a bold statement. What does that mean, no flesh? Does it mean just human? But in a nuclear war setting, all flesh is destroyed. Do you know we have the nuclear capabilities to destroy all the flesh on this earth tens of hundreds of times over and over and over. Could that be what he's talking about? Every day for the last four months, they have talked about a nuclear war. And we have heard it so much we don't even care. Do we even realize what that means? Well, in Revelation chapter 9, it says there's going to come a war and it's going to start out of the river Euphrates, and before it's done, one-third of the human race is going to die. Right now, that would be something like 2.5 billion people. That'll get your attention. So, you got to understand the difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God. So, to partake of Jesus Christ and to go into the millennial reign with Christ, the tribulational saint must endure until the end without taking the mark of the beast. That's one of the requirements. The expression, the end, is the signpost or the clue 
that the Bible gives you to look for to know when and where you're at in your Bible. Look at Hebrews 6, 11. Watch this. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. This thing comes up over and over and over. This period of time comes up over and over and over in the book of Hebrews. It's talking about the end of the age. The end of the world is how it's mentioned in Matthew 24, but that word world there means age. It's the point where Jesus comes back. That's why we think this book is written to saints that are alive at that tribulational period. It most definitely isn't written to honkies in Barsville. Look at Daniel 12, 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. That's the same period. The book of Daniel was to be sealed up until the time of the end. Daniel asked Gabriel, I don't understand what you're having me write down. And Gabriel said, don't worry about it. It's not for you to know. It's for the saints in the end. This is what he said. Seal up the book. Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. This is talking about an end time period. Look at Daniel 12, verse 8 and 9, just a little few verses down. Look what it says. And I heard, but I understood not. Daniel don't understand. Then said I, oh, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Well, I look just a little bit further in verse 13. But go thou thy way until the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. Well, that's this period of time, right? Look at Matthew 24. That's a Jewish man writing about a Jewish Messiah, recording what Jesus said to a bunch of Jewish disciples in Matthew 24, 13, 14, after they asked him, about the end of the age. He said, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Look at verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom, that's a different gospel. Now, it's the same gospel Jesus had them preaching while he was here. They're going to preach it again. Watch it. If you endure to the end, remember verse 13? Let's go back. Some people have short memories. If you endure to the end, the same shall be saved, period, 14. And, well, it's, an, it's, a, it's a conjunction, isn't it? And. Okay, do we have to sing the song? Conjunction, junction, watch your function? Hooking up words and phrases and clauses? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. When? At the end. And then shall the end come. Well, that gospel of the kingdom, that's a different gospel than what Paul preached. Look at Matthew 10, 22. And ye shall be hated of all men. The Jews certainly have been for my name's sake. But he that endureth to the end shall be saved. The Bible talks about the remnant of Jews at the end time are so hated by the Jews and the rest of the world, they got to run to a place called Petra to even live. They're supernaturally kept alive by the grace of God because they're hated so. Look at Matthew 13, verse 39 and 40. I could have done this to Mark or Luke, either one. I didn't want to just burden you with all of them. The enemy that sowed them, talking about the wheat and the tares, is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. Okay? So the parable of the, of the wheat and the tares, it's an end time parable. Did you catch that? The harvest is the end of the world. 
The reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, which is hell, so shall it be in the end of this world or this age when Jesus comes back. So, look at verse 49. Same parable, right? So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. Well, this phrase, the end of the world, the end of the age, it, it clues you in. Look at, look at Matthew 24, 3. And as he said upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, and they saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and the end of the age? So that's why Hebrew uses that same phrase. Endure to the end. Stand fast to the end. Look at Hebrews. We're back in Hebrews. This is a study of the book of Hebrews, believe it or not. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 7. Let's go all the way to the end of the chapter. Some of y'all said it couldn't be done. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said, today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Now, this Jewish writer is reminding these Hebrew Jewish people of one of the greatest stories that they all know, and that is the exodus out of Egypt of God's children. The provocation, go back to that verse if you will, guys. Thank you. The day of temptation in the wilderness where they provoked God. They hardened their hearts as in the provocation, the provoking of God, the unbelief and hardening of their heart. Next verse. Watch this. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Remember what I told you? Most people think the children of Israel came out of Egypt and they were just dutiful little Christian, little pilgrim looking things and they were all singing Kumbaya my Lord no they were devil worshippers but God made a promise to Abraham I, I'll not leave your people there, I'll, I'll take them out and he's true to his word and he covered their sin with the blood of a lamb like he covered your sin with the blood of his son. And it covers all sin. And sure, there was Beaver Cleaver uh, living in one hut and Ozzy and, you know, Ozzy Osbourne's family in the other hut, but they were all covered. That's a bad analogy, but it gets the point across, right? So I swear in my wrath, God says, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You know, that's the only sin. I, I tried to say that this morning. That's the only sin that will put you in hell. Unbelief. It's the only sin that Christ can't cover because he's got to leave you with your free will. Now, a lot of people can't wrap their brain around this. Adolf Hitler, every sin Adolf Hitler ever committed was covered at the cross. Adolf Hitler was forgiven. Now, if you don't like it, you can lump it, dump it, stump it, I don't care. Adolf Hitler was forgiven. Did he go to heaven? No. Well, I thought you said he was forgiven. I say he was forgiven. I didn't say he received it. Don't, don't you think Adolf Hitler out the blood of Christ? Pol Pot, how many millions of people he killed, forgiven. You name them. That doesn't mean they receive it. That doesn't mean they live forever in eternity. That doesn't mean they're born again. But they can't stand at the judgment and blame God. Watch. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Remember what we said this morning? It's sin 
that causes you to go mad. It's sin that causes the paranoia. It's sin. Haven't you ever seen people? Uh, for example, one time, I, I shouldn't now, when I went through seminary, they said, whatever you do, don't ever do this. But here I go. I was in high school. A bunch of us went to uh, Casa Bonita. And uh, we didn't have a whole lot of money, you know. And, and I was running with some rough, rough, real rough, you know, 14, 15-year-old boys. And one of them was in Casa Bonita, was back there by the, ca by the fountain cave thing. And right by that was a door that said, emergency exit. And somebody said, hey, dude, let's just go out the exit. And uh, before I could say, now, wait a minute, somebody hit the door, and all H-E double hockey sticks broke loose in that place. Lights was flashing, sirens going. What are you going to do, stand there with your, you know, plea, your guilty plea or run with everybody else? So uh, we get outside the door. You're at the back of that thing in a nasty, stinking alley that looks like it's 10 miles long till you can get to the parking lot. Well, we made it to the pickup, but all the way home, you can't imagine how many police officers you see when you think they're after you. <laughs> they're everywhere. And then a helicopter. It was probably going to some accident, but we just knew the helicopter was coming after us because four of us had, you know, jumped the ticket. Paranoia. Paranoia sets in. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. This is an um, encouragement to tribulational Jewish saints. Look at verse 15. While it is said today, if you will hear the voice, harden not your hearts as in the Exodus, when they provoked God, the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. They heard God said he was going to do this and that, and they still didn't believe. If you're in Sunday school, we're just sitting there amazed at the stupidity of these people on both sides, and I hope I taught that well this morning. The sin of Pharaoh caused him to lose his mind. He finally says, what did we do? Why did we let them go? Let's go after them. You're going to go get the group of people and bring them back that destroyed your whole nation? You know, in chapter 10 they said, dude, let them go. The whole nation is destroyed. But his sin, his hardening of his heart, has drove him mad. And then just a few verses later, these crazy Israelite people have seen God do miracle after miracle after miracle and they get trapped by God with water on one side and the Egyptian army on the other and their hardened hearts of disbelief cause them to lose their senses and they go mad and they say, God brought us out here to kill us in the desert. How frustrating it must be to be God. For some, when they had heard, did provoke God, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now I hope you get this. Give me the minute I need. That group of ending verses in that chapter are very clear to tell you this. When I teach it, people just scratch their head. All of the Israeli people weren't unbelieving when Moses comes down after 40 days on the mountain and he comes down, they're dancing around a golden calf. It's a widely known, very widely known story, the golden calf. The Bible says they're buck naked. They're dancing around some kind of music. Now, what kind of music do you think that is? Square dancing? No, they probably got their hats on backwards going, go, 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 wow, wow, probably something like that. And Moses tells the Levite people, he says, go put on your swords and go to their houses and kill every one of them. 
because they're a cancer to this people. Now, the, the Bible says God does not derive any pleasure out of the death of the wicked. But sometimes you've got to cut the cancer out. Uh, you may not want to, and it may hurt, and it may take you almost, sometimes cancer treatments take you to the point of death. Sometimes the treatment kills the person. But you can't let the cancer just keep on growing. So there's somewhere between a million and a half, three million people only 3,000 of them were dancing naked around a calf. Only 3,000 of them had talked Moses' lying brother, A. Aaron, into making a calf. So if you take the percentages, 3,000 out of conservatively a million and a half, that's not a very big percentage of people. Moses tells the Levites, go hunt them down. Go to their houses and tents and kill every one of them. 3,000 of them. But isn't that the story of the United States of America? It's always some little one-tenth of one percent that gets all the oil because the vast majority of other people are too busy working, too busy raising their families. And you got some pink-haired, you know, uh, guy that thinks he's a woman that gets all the attention, that gets all the legislation, that gets all the rights, and the rest of us just like, yeah, he's a nutcase, leave him alone, whatever. Now most everywhere else you go, I would say almost everywhere else you go, they will tell you that God allowed those people to walk around in the desert for 40 years until that generation of people died off. And every one of them died. Well, you know, years ago I was studying the Bible. I've taught Exodus probably 10 times and I thought, well, that don't make no sense because I can name you two by their first name. Joshua, which means salvation or Jesus, and Caleb. And Caleb was a Gentile. That's what got me on a study. Do you know when they left Egypt, there's a whole bunch of Egyptians went with them. All through that story it says, the stranger that went with you sojourned with you. You know what it said the night of the Passover? They said, God came to Moses. He said, all right, Moses, you tell them people. They got to take a lamb. It's got to be under a year old. Got to be perfect. Got to bring it in your house four days. Got to feed it, water it. Then you got to cut its throat. You got to drain its blood. You got to barbecue it. You got to put the blood on the door. And any of the Egyptians or Gentiles or strangers from any other land that want to get in on this thing, they can take a lamb. They can do the exact same thing, and the death angel will cover them, but they got the males have to be circumcised because they got to have a relationship with me in order to get in on this good deal called the Passover. And when they left that night, there's all kinds of people with them. But I was taught my whole life that God just waited till all those people died, every last one of them. And I was saying, what about Joshua and Caleb? And so I asked my pastor, and he said, well, everybody but them too. I mean, that didn't sit right. So I want to show you something. Go back, I believe it's verse 16 with an NIV Bible. Watch this. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? Now wait a minute. Go back to that verse again. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? Look at the next verse. And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? Now I want you to go back to verse 16 in a King James Bible, and let's see if it reads different. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. How be it? Not all. Now, I want to show you something. From this point on, the whole rest of this chapter is abundantly clear that it was not all of the people that came out of Egypt at all. But in every other Bible translation, 
It teaches you the exact opposite. Now, that might not be a problem for you, but it is for me. Watch this. Watch how this flows. And guys, we're just going to keep going to 19, okay? For someone they had heard did provoke. How be it? Not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. They didn't all provoke. They didn't all prevail. But with whom he was grieved 40 years, question mark, was it not with them that had sinned? Well, yeah, he wasn't mad at everybody. He wasn't grieved with everybody. How be it not all of them revoked, rebelled? He just grieved with those that sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness. Well, who fell? The ones that rebelled. Watch. And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. But it wasn't a whole generation. It was a remnant. Do you know what they changed? One word. It changes the whole thing. Now, if that doesn't bother you, <laughs> then just keep your head in the sand. But I want to warn you, when you got your head in the sand, you have another part of your anatomy exposed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this book. What an amazing book. That we can understand, that we can glean so much from. God, I just thank you for these people that love you and they love your word. God, we pray for the people of this church that are sick and, and uh, for whatever reason couldn't make it tonight. We pray especially for our, our uh, neighbor, our mate, our Australian mate and his bride. And we just ask you to bring them back to us healthy and, and healed from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for another great day here at Matoka. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, folks.